And what? What is this? A respiratory virus originating in Wuhan, capable of taking many lives and able to topple governments. And who is capable of neutralizing such a virus? Only me. Only you. Thank you, good doctor. Welcome to Finance in 5, bringing you the best tools to protect and grow your finances. Now, the coronavirus pandemic is all over the news, and on today's program, we're going to be looking at five economic effects of this crisis. Coming up. Welcome to the channel, and if you're new here, please consider subscribing. It would be wonderful if you could smash that like for the YouTube algorithm. Let's get into the video. Let's ask ourselves, is it accurate to claim that coronavirus is new? Coronavirus has comprised 7-15% to of all influenza cases since 2005, according to studies conducted by virologists in Glasgow. Experts say the condition produces a short illness in many, more severe symptoms in others, with deaths being the smallest proportion of the total caseload overall. Clearly though, even young people have become infected and died during this pandemic. I'm not trying in any way to downplay the significance of the illness or to minimize the tragedy that has befallen many families as a result of contact with the disease. Perhaps though, the reasons why certain individuals found themselves more susceptible will not emerge for many years. But even if we knew the reasons, their loved ones would remain inconsolable. At the same time, is it possible that a death rate of 3% at the upper estimates, many of whom had underlying health problems, does not warrant the draconian levels of government intervention that we are witnessing? The table here shows the relative death risks for various age groups following exposure to the virus. This table shows that in comparison with both SARS and MERS, the relative death risk following exposure to coronavirus is far smaller, and this is a statistic that we may come back to. But you wouldn't be thinking any of this if you tuned into the news for even a few minutes. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. In Britain now, they are asking everybody aged 70 years or older to self-quarantine for four months. Whatever your thoughts on the virus, this represents an unprecedented peacetime intrusion into the personal liberties of voters everywhere. You might not get any symptoms, say health chiefs. The vast majority of people have a mild illness, but some get a very severe illness. Boris Johnson's father, Stanley, was on the radio yesterday and was asked if he will comply with this order. He said no way. He would still go down to the pub. So, government self-isolation guidelines appear draconian to many people, and many people are not correspondingly fearful about what's going to happen to them. The evidence suggests that even older people recover in many cases without treatment. In the midst of the fear and panic, many are asking, what effects is the virus having on the economy at large? Well, in this video, we are going to subdivide its impact into five areas. Number one, economic slowdown. If you're watching this, it's probably safe to assume that you're not working and you're not alone. Normal life as we know it is over. Lots of people aren't working. Busy shopping and cafe districts in major cities and small towns have become deserted. Gigs, festivals, concerts and meetings have been cancelled, postponed or changed to a video format where possible. Like many countries, China has stopped producing cars as have VW and Nissan. Many people have already lost their jobs and small businesses have been crushed. Workers are working from home. Classes are streaming online and that includes fitness and dance lessons as well as college lectures. More people are subscribing to online streaming platforms like Disney, Viacom and Warner Media since they need to keep their spirits up somehow now that they won't be leaving the house anytime soon. Working from home has caused a drop in discretionary spending because people avoid public transport and restaurants, some of which attempt to struggle along without regular patrons or tourists. Most are unable to claim insurance payouts for the disruption. High street retailers face prolonged misery as they brace for dwindling takings amid government-enforced crackdowns on pensioners leaving their homes, not to mention staff absences. If the press is to be believed, as many as 7 million Britons are projected to require hospitalisation due to the virus by spring 2021. 
If businesses choose to accept the Chancellor's offer of loans, they will be incurring additional debt burdens, which many don't want, because unlike the government, they dislike spending more money that they can't afford to repay. Meanwhile, online merchants such as Uber Eats, Amazon and Deliveroo are witnessing a surge in their market share as people order food online to be delivered to their door for pickup, such as the desperation of each party to avoid contact with the virus. On top of panic buying of toilet paper, you panicked, and your weakness has cost the lives of three others. Record numbers are purchasing B-Days, which cleanse your buttocks using high-speed water jets, I'm told. Even the gilded heights of sport and entertainment have fallen prey to this epidemic. All tennis tournaments have been cancelled worldwide, including the Miami Open, although the ban is likely to continue for longer since the French Open has also been rescheduled for the autumn. It remains unclear whether or not Wimbledon will go ahead. Players ranked outside the top 100 who rely on these smaller tournaments for their livelihoods will be hit hard. Sponsors, the tourism industry and the local economy will lose money. VE Day commemorations and the Chelsea Flower Show have been cancelled. Weddings have been put back. Holidays have been cancelled. The 25th Bond film, No Time to Die, has had its UK release date delayed until the 12th of November. TV shows have been delayed, including season 2 of Apple's The Morning Show, starring Jennifer Aniston and Reese Witherspoon. Events such as Coachella and South by Southwest have been cancelled. The panic gripping shareholders globally has been more infectious than the virus itself. With the Dow approaching 30,000 just three weeks ago, many claim that shares were due a correction, but investors are selling with renewed frenzy as each trading session opens, with stock markets tumbling and coiling the world over. Side note here, I mentioned Disney earlier in this video. I personally think that now is a good time to buy Disney shares, or any blue chip equity. In finance, one of the best things that you can do is find out what everybody else is doing, and then do the exact opposite. Disney, in spite of the controversy of it throwing a closing party the other day just before its theme parks shut up shop, has a strong balance sheet and once its parks reopen, its share price is sure to spike up, meaning the shares are available now at a huge discount. If you're new to buying shares, my personal favourite platform is Trading212, as you can open an account in minutes and it's completely free to trade. The Federal Reserve offering at least $1.5 trillion worth of short-term loans to banks didn't save the day, mainly because the banks just hoard the money themselves and they don't lend it out to individuals or to companies. The market still plunged, showing that the Federal Reserve is powerless and so are all central banks. Manipulating interest rates lower no longer seems to stimulate the economy and it doesn't encourage people to spend. It's almost as though these banks and governments don't know what on earth they are doing. In the US, the government's economic stimulus is set quickly to balloon into a trillion dollar bailout in the coming days, which is going to be the largest rescue in modern American history. But instead of banks, this time we're dealing with major industries because they're screaming loudly to the Trump administration for help. We see the London Stock Exchange drop 8% within the first 30 minutes of trading, and the market circuit break are being triggered due to sell-offs exceeding 8% on New York's trading floors. Last week, we saw not only the largest points drop in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but also the largest gain, which took place as the index climbed 9.36%, or 1,985 points, on Friday, March the 13th, following President Trump's televised address, which outlined the US government's response to tackling the virus. No, but you're actually much too close. You, know, you two, you should leave immediately. Quarantines are being rolled out increasingly throughout Europe, and there's no way of predicting the size or scope of these restrictions, or when they are likely to come to an end. The judgment of our advisors has been that closing schools is actually of limited value in slowing the spread of the epidemic. The inescapable reality of a pandemic and its associated disruptions is that there is a reduction in the demand for goods and services as people with money sequester themselves from harm and hoard capital as opposed to spending it. This, combined with a reduction in the quantity of labour due to death and sickness, has led to the lowest global growth projections in 50 years. The virtual erasure of holiday planning by many, the plunge of small businesses and the collapse in asset prices, including an 11-year low in the price of silver, paint a picture that this crisis is bigger in size and scope than the dot-com bubble and the 2008 housing collapse combined. Vast portions of the economy have been undermined by this coronavirus scare. Number two, 
collapse of the airline industry. This results mainly from travel restrictions. Donald Trump has imposed a ban on travel from Europe, which will be reviewed after 30 days. Planes are grounded throughout Europe. Many will say this was inevitable. Aviation is a volatile sector which can be disrupted by many unforeseen events like terrorist attacks, public health emergencies, sudden downturns, and the like. Airlines have extremely high fixed costs, which include owning, leasing, or servicing expensive planes, and paying the wages and pensions of large workforces, not to mention jet fuel and insurance, plus refunding complaining passengers and covering the costs routinely of lost or damaged luggage and equipment and goods. They can't predict who's going to fly even a few weeks beyond the present day. At least that was the case before these blanket restrictions on flights took effect. EasyJet has cancelled all of its flights, and just yesterday Jet2 rerouted planes heading to Spain back to Glasgow as a response to the Spanish government's ban on inbound flights to contain the illness. So the airline industry is hemorrhaging cash on an unprecedented basis, which has exposed its vulnerability to a dip in customer demand. As Warren Buffett once said, it's only when the tide goes out that you discover who's been swimming naked. I know what you're thinking, Warren Buffett is a naturist. Finally, we have an explanation for that perennial grandfatherly chuckle <laughs> in the past. When there have been large numbers of cancellations, airlines thought to themselves, no problem, let's just drop our prices and fill the seats that way. People always want a bargain after all, let's just sell cheaper tickets. But this time, because of government restrictions, there is no one to sell cheaper tickets to. Alex Cruz, the CEO of British Airways, called COVID-19 a crisis of global proportions like no other we have known, and said that the airline would have to cut jobs. Just imagine if British Airways, the national carrier, goes under. Many of its loyal workers would face unemployment, which is bad enough, but it would also mean that anyone with an American Express British Airways credit card of any type is wasting their time collecting Avios points for discounted flights or companion vouchers. I realize that's not the most important consideration, but it's certainly one of them. Airlines are also offering unpaid leave to their employees. Virgin is doing that. KLM is cutting 2,000 jobs, which is the same number slashed by Flybe when it collapsed last month. Insurers, including AXA UK, came out yesterday and said that its new policies would not cover cancellation or disruption caused by the pandemic. The US Treasury Secretary says that he would be happy to fly domestically, and he's unconcerned about the virus. Meanwhile, Trump is promising to extend liquidity to US airlines to prevent them from going bust. It remains to be seen what effect the virus will have. We will get through this. Americans should know we have the best medical professionals, we have the best medical system, and we will conquer this disease. But analysts predict a fall in global passenger revenue in 2020 of between 63 and 113 billion dollars. And it's interesting to note that many of these businesses are calling for injections of cash from their government in order to survive, notably Virgin or Delta, with Richard Branson requesting a government cash injection of close to 7 billion pounds into the airline sector. But any money the government has, it either takes from you or has to borrow, which is what we will come to next. Number three growth of the state. The coronavirus outbreak has caused many governments, particularly in socialist economies of Europe, to increase borrowing. The UK Chancellor Rishi Sunak, for example, has announced plans to pay for up to two weeks of sick pay for workers and to eliminate business rates and pay-as-you-earn taxes for up to the first £3,000, with many large retailers, including Cafe Nero, requesting that financial assistance be extended to them in view of their overheads, such as rent being fixed yet unpayable in the midst of staff and customer shortages. It will be offering emergency loans for businesses and mortgage holidays for individuals up to three months. Which begs the question, how will all of this borrowing be paid for? Boris Johnson has also pledged that the NHS will receive whatever funding is necessary for the eradication of this we virus. Keep everything under continuous review. We've always said that we're, we're going we're gonna to do the right measures at the right time. That's what we've that's what we've done. This sum takes the overall debt burden of the United Kingdom to well over the two trillion pound mark. The Bank of England cut its rates last week, which will reduce the UK government's interest payments on the debt that it already owes. Historically, over the past several years, the government has spent over 40% of the GDP collected in tax, but the first and second quarters of 2020 will see the UK's GDP trending down hard to pay for healthcare and welfare, while spending will rise, which is a recipe for disaster. Spending more is one thing, but it's the people who... People who
people who generate revenue for HMRC through their financially productive activities which are taxed. Many of those won't be working or spending as a result of this illness, leading to a lower tax take by the Treasury, the upshot of which is more borrowing to make up the shortfall, and that leads to more debt, all while public sector pensions and the NHS need to be paid for. It remains to be seen how much the government will spend, but it will be a lot. And unlike an individual, when the government spends more money than it has, no one puts it in prison. It just borrows more. The problem with borrowing is that it represents what the founding fathers of the American Constitution called taxation without representation. The money borrowed will need to be repaid by future generations who were not alive to be able to vote on the spending. Many argue that it's fine to borrow when interest rates are low because it's cheap for government, but they ignore the fact that savers aren't getting any return on their investment, so they're unlikely to spend, and it's that spending which stimulates the economy. There will need to be more borrowing to sustain the unfunded liability such as pensions. The UK could be spending up to £1 trillion per year according to this newspaper article. And when the interest rates do return to higher levels in the not too distant future, this is likely to lead to interest rate expenditures far higher than the country's ability to repay them on the debt. As the dam breaks open, people will see the government's foolish mismanagement of our finances for what they are. Maybe this will lead to a smaller state eventually if the government collapses, but it's unlikely. Number four, shutdown of protests. Threats of prison and fines are making the news everywhere. Governments are enforcing 14-day quarantines and self-isolation as well as curfews, which are important for minimizing onward transmissions, but prevent people from going about their normal everyday activities. Already the coronavirus has been used to close down protests in Hong Kong and Downing Street now is invoking the Civil Contingencies Act of 2004 to suspend large public gatherings. But it didn't do this a few days ago for the Stereophonics gig in Cardiff, nor for Luis Capaldi's gig. It also is continuing to allow people from Italy and Spain back into the UK unvetted, in spite of the fact that these countries represent those worst affected by this outbreak. The health of the public is naturally of prime consideration, particularly the vulnerable elderly. But in view of the fact that many COVID-19 cases are self-limiting and resolve without medical intervention, the natural effect of outlawing gatherings of several hundred people is to deny members of the public their right to protest peacefully. It is interesting to consider the fact that the right of individuals to protest vanishes in the midst of this contagion. Many will say, correctly, that this is a right they are more than willing to set aside in favour of protecting and preserving their health. After all, why would you care about protesting at all if your health was at risk or under threat? The hidden danger, though, is that governments can roll out this protest ban for as long as they deem necessary, and that time frame will probably remain unspecified and not be subject to a democratic vote, but rather to the whim of politicians, who may see this as a valuable tool for crushing dissent. Many are mindful of the fact that Bernie Sanders was denied the Democratic Party nomination in 2016 when the convention handed it to Hillary. He's running again this time, and his supporters may wish to exercise the right to protest if he is denied the nomination the second time round. So we may expect to see clashes between public and law enforcement in the states. There may be a rise in violence or civil unrest if governments restrict people's freedoms excessively, just like the Paris protests. Riot police mainstays of rubber bullets, water cannon and tear gas can always be deployed by the state to disperse crowds if skirmishes escalate. Number five, currency replacement. And you said we need to go to a global virtual currency. Give us the thumbnail. Why? Why? This is something that will become a topic of conversation more in the future. But already the Bank of England has released this document in March. What is the purpose of this? Why release a document about central bank digital currency if there is no problem whatsoever with the existing financial system? The Bank of England claims that CBDC or central bank digital currency would be an electronic store of central bank money that could be used by households and businesses to pay for things and they would probably declare this to be risk free. Here is a picture of a poster at a coffee shop near me. Cash payments are banned in the wake of the COVID-19 epidemic, and this is happening more and more in shops throughout the world, particularly in the UK and Canada. This business might be ahead of the curve here, but the idea that the elimination of cash is not on the wish list of central banks and governments is at best fanciful. 
They love the idea of a digital currency because they believe they can tax everything and prevent fraud. But it would also mean the elimination of privacy and probably the end of cryptocurrencies. Why would I say such a thing? Well, in my view, Bitcoin and Ethereum and Ripple and all of them would be requisitioned by government and made illegal. Because there's no way that the government would be allowing private cryptocurrencies to flourish and free market transactions to occur without the government being able to take its pound of flesh in the form of taxes. If interest rates rise even a little bit, the banks will collapse. So either they admit error and surrender their authority, or they double down and impose a digital currency using the coronavirus pandemic as a cover to sneak it into use and cancel the use of paper currency. I hear you saying, Adam, you're insane. Why on earth would they do that? It's only been a few weeks since they printed the new £20 note. How could you even suggest something so absurd? I realise it sounds far-fetched, but this is a crisis and Europe cancels its currencies all the time. To pull off this sleight of hand using the coronavirus as a justification, we probably see the Bank of England and the European Central Bank do exactly what President Roosevelt did back in 1933. What happened then? Well, he declared a two-week banking holiday, and on the 5th of April 1933, Roosevelt signed his infamous Executive Order 6102. FDR's gold confiscation meant that private owners were obliged to take their coins, bars, or gold certificates to a bank and exchange them for dollars at the prevailing rate of 2067 per ounce. The banks were shut, they were on the verge of collapse, the government too, mass unemployment threatened civil unrest, and the radical and shocking solution was to grab private wealth and try to use it to reboot the system. Threats of prison and fines were issued to those who would dare to deviate from Roosevelt's decree. Violation of this order was punishable by fines of up to $10,000, which is equivalent to $198,000 in 2019, or up to 10 years in prison, or both. The point here is that when faced with problems like debt, the government will come down hard on the people in order to preserve its own survival. Are we really unable to uncouple our rational thinking processes from the train that has been set in motion? We don't want potentially infectious people uh, arriving in hospitals, but we recognise that the public, and particularly our key workers, uh, want to understand their health status uh, so that they can back, get back to normal activities. So Admittedly, infection is going to happen, even with the best precautions, and it's almost impossible to assign causality to specific persons. If we're fighting an invisible enemy... Careful sanitation and hand washing are critical alongside vigilance when touching any surfaces used by lots of members of the public such as ATMs, shopping trolleys, turnstiles, door handles, escalators, public transport, even clothes in high street shops. Follow Dr. Oz's advice and sterilize your phone and phone case every 24 hours with a 70% alcohol wipe or ultraviolet sterilizer. Face masks lack effectiveness at preventing viral transmission since the COVID-19 pathogen can be absorbed through mucous membranes in the eyes. Stay at home until you recover. Why? Because very few clinical interventions have been shown to be effective. There is a drug called remdesivir, produced by Gilead Biosciences in America. It's a nucleotide analogue that confuses an enzyme called RNA polymerase, which exists inside the virus. Viruses usually die out unless their RNA can replicate inside host cells. Remdesivir, once absorbed into the virus, evades proofreading by exoribonuclease, which causes a decrease in viral RNA production. And that's what makes this therapy effective. Other drugs deemed to be effective include chloroquine, which is an anti-malaria drug, and a drug called Keletra, which is a combination of two protease inhibitors, lopinavir and ritonavir, first developed to prevent the replication of HIV. Other holistic measures to mitigate the effects of the virus have been mooted, which include exposure to sunlight, high doses of intravenous or lipospheric vitamin C, and sleeping. So let me know what you think about this. There's a lot going on, the story is changing all the time, but there's no denying that this virus is going to have profound and long-lasting effects on the economy of this country and the economies of many countries throughout the world, if not all countries. Just because the curfew has been imposed and even if the curfew is lifted that does not necessarily mean that we're going to be able to return to a state of normality the effects of this virus are only just being felt people are not working taxes aren't going to be collected because of the immediate collapse in the production and the productive capacity of the citizens of all these countries all of the factories laying off workers the small businesses closing the impacts 
that this is having are becoming more apparent by the day and are becoming more unbelievable by the hour. Let me know what your thoughts are. How are we going to get through this? What are your strategies? Have you decided to change the way you live? Are you working from home? Have you developed a side hustle that you're pursuing? Comment below because it will give me an idea of what you want us to talk about on this channel. And that's it for today. I look forward to speaking to you soon. And please be sure to like and subscribe. All the very best. Take care.